Good. Now let's skip down to uh, chapter 23. And uh, there, there's been a conversion here, and the, the chief king in, in verse 2 is going to send out a decree in throughout all the land. I think it's interesting what kind of a decree this is. Yeah, I think he has all this power over the entire land, and he could send a decree saying, this is what our religion should be, and everyone listen to these missionaries, and you will all be baptized. But he doesn't. He sends the decree saying in verse 3 that the word of God must have no obstruction so that everyone still has that individual agency to be able to hear and then to choose. So the proclamation is not one of command to listen, but rather it is don't pre prohibit them from preaching. Exactly. Exactly. So that the gospel can spread freely. Then over in verse 6, as sure as the Lord liveth, so sure as many as have believed, or as many as were brought to a knowledge of the truth through the preaching of Ammon and his brethren, according to the spirit of revelation and of the prophecy and of the power of God, working miracles in them. Yea, I say unto you, as the Lord liveth, as many of the Lamanites as believed in their preaching and were converted unto the Lord, never did fall away. That's a remarkable story. It is, and I think that very verse tells, in some ways, why they didn't fall away. What they're their conversion is based on that they have the spirit of revelation and this gift of prophecy where they can bear testimony of Jesus Christ by the Spirit. And, and have, we'll soon see they have plenty of opportunities that could have been easy for them <laughs> to back away or to deny this, and yet they won't, which is, they so they, their, their faith is but tested. But in ways, this is a realization of the blessing of Lehi on them, isn't it? Yes, it is. Mm. Yeah. That the curse would be removed, their separation from God would be removed. Yeah, Lehi would be knew blessed. that the Lamanites were going to have these problems because of the traditions of their fathers, yeah. but they would be blessed. And now they've realized, once they're converted and have these spiritual gifts, that there's some things in their lives in the past that, that need to be straightened out. They need to, to make some atonement. So in verse 7, they, they, they did lay down the weapons of their rebellion. I think it's interesting, the wording here, because it doesn't, it's not saying specifically they're going to lay down their swords. Or their weapons of war. Their weapons of war. Not quite that. We know some the, do later, but here's yeah. broader. It, it's the weapons of rebellion. And then it specifies the two kinds of weapons they're laying down. That they did not fight against uh, God. That is, their, their spiritual weapons of rebellion. They're going to lay those down now mm -hmm. because they're converted. And more, and neither against any of their brethren. Now they're also going to lay down their weapons of war, the physical things. So, so they're going to lay down all of those types of rebellion spiritual and physical which they have been practicing prior to this time I will give away all my sins there they all are there yeah. they are yes yeah. well they take upon themselves a, a unusual name here too that uh, is verse 17 right yes uh, and and becomes 16. a significant uh, part for them and they're in their commitment to, to be distinguished as it were in their covenants that they're going to make it is an unusual name and, and it's not unusual that you take a different name when you've gone through a conversion process we see that every once in a while but the name is quite unusual uh, some people I think read it as as English anti Nephi Lehi's I always wondered whether this might not also rather than a translation of a Nephite word be a transliteration that is to reproduce uh, the sounds of a Nephite word rather than the meaning of the word and, and, and therefore, I'm not sure that we can ever figure out what the name really means. Yeah, I mean, it's just as possible because we find out that when Lamona's father dies, that a son who takes the name Anti-Nephi-Lehi becomes their new king. I mean, it may be that they're named after yeah. their new righteous king. So, so we may not know whether this is a transliteration, as you say, or perhaps a translation. If it is a translation, it's important for people to know it doesn't mean they're fighting against Nephi and Lehi. Yeah. It's probably the sense of anti in place of or number us among. The, yes. the followers of Nephi. Yes, Lehi. or that we used to belong to the group that was anti-Nephi Lehi. We're not yeah. those people anymore. Yeah. But the important thing is they see themselves <laughs> as a new group. Yes, the people yes. of God. Yeah. And, and then, the consequence at the end of verse 18, the curse of God did no more follow them. And you mentioned that earlier, but just a real quick remembering that couplet throughout the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And when you keep the commandments, you'll prosper in the land. And when you keep not the commandments, you'll be cut off from my presence. If we look at those as opposites. We see the curse all through the Book of Mormon is being cut off from the presence of God. True prosperity in the eyes of God is when we are not cut off, when we are in His presence, and that's what's happened to them. Yes, yeah. These people have seen themselves, as we see in chapter 24, that they have, they, they're asking in verse 10 that we might repent of these things, and also that uh, He hath uh, get forgiven us of our many sins and murders which we've committed. They, they felt their going into battle against the Nephites was, was just atrocious. They realized this, and they want, verse 13... It's only after they're converted that that's they realize right, that how they bad see, it was. That's right, and they, and they're, they want their, the, the stain on their swords to be taken away, and, uh, and even such that uh, we're going to, 
we're going to try to hide these up and bury them deep in the earth so we're not tempted to return to this again and I think there's a significance for us and that is what sins what uh, transgressions do we have in our lives that we need to distance ourselves from or symbolically bury deep in the ground we won't, out of sight, yeah, out of we reach. won't take them up again and, and we could think of all kinds of things people can do and, and we need to follow their example in that sense of making sure we're not tempted to return and and then making a covenant in the process of doing it and too. be yeah. serious about that covenant every single day huh? uh, and the seriousness of the covenant is going to come up because uh, back there in, in chapter 24 verse 4 the the main Lamanite king the head king is, is <coughs> dies yep. and that's going to open up the uh, the possibility for rebellion among the Lamanites including the Amulonites and the Amalekites who uh, uh, to rebel against the order Well, his son and successor is high king this would yes. be Lamoni's brother he takes the name Antony Philehi apparently does not have the same degree of power and influence and respect that his father had earned. So the Amalekites, the Malachites, and the non-believing Lamanites rebel against their brethren who are believers, and it's, so, it's tragic. And, and, and because of this threat, they're going to make a covenant now, as we've mentioned before, they're going to bury their weapons. So in verse 17, they've buried their weapons. Then verse 18, we have the covenant that is made. And this they did, it being in their, in their view, a testimony. So the bearing of the weapons is simply a sign of their covenant that they would use weapons that they would never use weapons against the uh, shedding of men's blood. Uh, and this they did, vouching and covenanting with God, that rather than shed the blood of men of their brethren, they would give up their own lives. So we get this, this long-term consequence of this uh, covenant that they've made. And, and uh, because we're running out of time, uh, we all know that uh, uh, they... Um, uh, what they did, they actually gave up their lives rather than taking up the sword. And a thousand and, and five of them are killed and they're joined that day by more people who were touched because of the sacrifice than were killed. Uh, and, and now let's see if we can get a summary of all that we've talked about here. Eric, uh, can you summarize our discussion well, today? I think it's interesting. What we've seen happen is the transformative power of the atonement on people's lives, whether it be Zeezrom and Ammonihah, whether it be Lamoni, Lamoni's father, or here whole groups of people. The atonement can change <clears throat> us completely. It can make us like Christ. It can make us men and women of peace, which is really what the Anti-Nephi-Lehi's are symbolizing by doing this. Uh, verse 27 of chapter 24 says, uh, partway through the verse, one of these great Mormon editorials, And thus we see the Lord worketh in many ways the salvation of his people. Zeezrom is converted one way, Lamoni another, all these Lamanites another way. The, the sad part of the story is for those who will not be changed by the atonement. This is verse 30. And thus we can plainly discern that after a people have once been enlightened by the Spirit of God, probably talking mostly about Amalekites and Amalonites here, and having had a great knowledge of things pertaining to righteousness, and have fallen away into transgression, their final state is worse than it had been before. Thank you. Thus we see, as, as you said in uh, the universe 23, God works in his own way for the salvation of people if they're willing to listen. What a great lesson from the Book of Mormon. Thank you. Thank you for being with me.